Everybody, thank you for coming to our second panel discussion. This particular panel discussion, we obviously have three new individuals. Uh, we're going to introduce them, but we're going to focus on something slightly different, which is networking um, in this particular panel discussion. So I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Sure. Uh, my name is Matt Strausser. I'm a wildlife biologist. Um, I work right now at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, my job right there in um, down in Clear Lake is to manage the wildlife and the undeveloped land uh, that the Space Center has. So it's about 1,600 acres, um, including you know, our main site as well as uh, parts of Ellington Field and other areas. And um, my job is, is partially in conservation, but it's also with conflict management to make sure that we have you know, a rich diversity and, and, and huge populations of wildlife there, but that those wildlife don't interfere with our aerospace operations or any sort of safety issues that we have with that. Um, so it's both to, to conserve and to manage and to sort of sometimes act as an arbiter between um, our aerospace operations and, and our natural world. I'm Joanne Baptist. Um, I am the Educator and Adult Programs Coordinator at the Houston Zoo. And that lovely title just means that I do uh, professional development for teachers during the school year. And then during the summer, I actually lead a program for college students called the Collegiate Conservation Program. And we take college students out to visit a variety of conservation organizations around the city, as well as learning what it means to be a zoo-based conservation organization at the Houston Zoo. Uh, before coming to the Houston Zoo, I was actually a fifth grade teacher for five years, and I kind of I've gotten into the informal science side of things through the formal education. Uh, so I have a little interesting path of how I got to the zoo. Nice. I'm Danny Milliken. I'm the conservation program manager for Memorial Park, um, and I manage the conservation programs. No, I'm just kidding. That was, you know, <laughs> the title. But no, we have a, a biocycle program that's a compost yard. We make our own compost from all the trees that come off. Some elephant dung from the zoo goes in it. Um, really good stuff. We also have a native grow out where we're growing hundreds of thousands of native plants um, to be used all over the Houston area and also do volunteers. So those are my, those are my programs. Okay, so the title of this particular panel is um, Making Connections, How Your Personal Connections Help to Shape Your Career Path. So could each of you just tell us a little bit about how you got to where you got to your career and some of those networking elements that have gotten you there in your life? Sure, I guess I'll start. Um, I started uh, on the Johnson as a temporary employee. Um, so I was, I was brought out on a short-term contract. And um, it wasn't what I was looking for at the time. I had just gotten out of grad school. I was looking for a permanent career. I was looking for a career that would be sort of, you know, um, just jump right to sort of what some people call post career or something, right? Um, but I took the six months contract because I was broke, and uh, which you often are coming out of grad school. And uh, I met the people there, and in, in many ways gained their trust through through the projects I, I completed and the things I wrote, the reports and the technical recommendations, and. Um, it was through fostering those relationships within that organization, both within my company and within the government, um, that allowed me to sort of stay on, and then that got extended and extended and extended, and ultimately became a, uh, a long-term, long-term position. Um, so, going into my current job, that job didn't exist. Um, it, it was I, I helped create it uh, with the people that I had made contact with. Um, the job, you know, sort of was never posted or anything like that. It was something that as a group of people we came up with. So it was important to make those connections with people who had decision-making capabilities um, to talk about what I could do for them and, and, and what kind of position that they create for me. So it was very much a uh, sort of a team effort with that. Um, and you know, if I would have sort of gone in there and done my six month thing and then sort of left, um, you know, I would have had to pursue a different career. Um, but by, by fostering those relationships, I was able to create a position for myself. Yeah, so as I shared, I was a fifth grade teacher before coming and working at the Houston Zoo full time and I realized after teaching for a year that I couldn't have an entire summer off without anything to do because my bank account didn't like that. And so during my uh, second summer, te second year teaching, I decided to look for volunteer opportunities. I found my way to the Houston Zoo and not only did I find some volunteer opportunities, but I also found that they do a summer camp at the zoo. And I applied for that summer camp. I got that position in 2009, which It'll be 10 years this year uh, that I've been doing this. And um, 
So I started working summer camp. I never really kind of grew up with a love of animals. I appreciated them, but I never thought I would work in a zoo one day. So it's kind of odd that I am doing what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, and so I just started teaching summer camp. I kept teaching my fifth grade students and then slowly but surely I fell in love with the zoo. I fell in love with the animals. And one summer I was in the process of uh, changing over to a different school, a different district on the other side of town. And I, uh, the, uh, three full-time positions opened up at the Houston Zoo. And I was really debating on whether or not I should actually apply for it, but then the VP of our department at the time actually pulled me aside and said, I highly recommend you apply for this position. And when anybody kind of tells you to do that, you do it, because you're pretty sure you're gonna get the job. Uh, and so I applied for it, I got it, and that was in 2012, and so it'll be seven years that I've been at the zoo full-time. But if it hadn't have been for working summer camp and having them see what kind of educator I was and getting first-hand experience about the kind of person I am through that I wouldn't I wouldn't have the position all three people that they hired that summer were from summer camp because they knew us from that and so just by getting my foot in the door even though I was only there for maybe six weeks a year doing summer camp I was able to kind of get to where I'm at today I don't think I've had a job that wasn't at least somewhat based on being referred to or at least references beefing me up as the candidate um, above other candidates. There's a lot of skilled people out there. There's so many skilled and knowledgeable people. Um, specializing in something while you're young and learning a lot about that for me, it was edible foods, the what parts of a plant are edible, if any parts, you know, not just vegetables, but everything um, set me aside. But then also people knowing that about me kind of elevated that specialization. So you can specialize and nobody know, or you can specialize and then, you know, it'd be something that you kind of network to, to, to have it figure out where it's known that about you. So my specific job now kind of became um, an expert in soil and compost tea especially, and then soil improvement. Growing soils um, is kind of what I became a specialist in as a career and as a horticulturalist for a while. Um, but again, every job that I've really, you know, had that I wanted, you know, not counting like uh, working at Freebirds in college or something like that, but um, came because someone recommended, hey, you need to try for this job and also references um, being excellent. So it's kind of like, a, it just, you know, that saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know is not true. Uh, it's both. And so, but both really do matter a lot. I think something that's really interesting from all three of the things that y'all said is that really, it wasn't like you just coldly applied to a job that you didn't have any knowledge to, you didn't have any insight into. One of the reasons that you were able to get the jobs and the careers that you have is that somebody there either knew, wanted you to come in, or you've made a connection at that place. And so, unfortunately, I think this reveals like a dirty secret of the world, which is that in reality, most of the jobs that people get are not jobs that they've just randomly gone out to the world and applied to. A lot of the times we have our jobs because somebody said, I want you to apply for this thing because I'm part of this thing that needs somebody like you to get in there. And the only way that you can do that is to impress people. Right? So I think Matthew said it really well at the beginning. He thought about the needs of the people that would eventually offer a job. That's really powerful, right? Can you, can you say a little bit more about that? What did you recognize that those people wanted and what did you kind of try to align with when you were trying to do your work? Sure. Um, I had a, a professor in, in college who um, mixed feelings about because he was so right in this in this uh, particular case. But he would ask some kind of qu test question. My, my, I did an undergraduate degree in forestry. And so you know, you have a stand of forest that's this, you know, and has this basal area and this mix of species. You know, what do you do with it? And and it was a trick question because the que the answer to the question was well, it depends on what your goals are. You know, and so that you can have all this knowledge about science and all this knowledge about uh, wildlife management or forestry management or, 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 or horticultural management. But unless you know what the goals of the organization you're working for are, um, you, you can't really uh, advance their interests, um, which, which is ultimately your goal as, as an employee. Um, so when I was first came on with my company, they said, look, we have these problems, we think, um, come deal with them. And so coming in and defining those problems, um, measuring them, and establishing goals to help address those problems, and even maybe some steps that you could take to address those problems, 
uh, through like a management plan or um, a master plan, which some people call it that, um, help them understand what they needed. Because a lot of times these organizations, especially if they're large organizations, don't even know what they need. They just see a problem. And um, saying, look, you know, these are the problems you have, these are things that we can do it, and, and these are ways that I can help you achieve those objectives. And really clearly analyzing all those things down there, and, and that may or may not have anything to do with biology, but it is how it works, how problems are solved and how issues are addressed in the long term. And then you know, saying like, okay, you know, where do I fit in? Where does my skill set and my passion and uh, my background fit in with solving those problems? So it's a lot of problem definition, it's a lot of problem recognition and goal setting, um, and then you can see where you fit in with that, with that um, framework. So, and Joanne, you said in your story that you didn't actually set out to impress these people, you just did. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what, <laughs> you think it was, like, what, what, did, what do you think it was about what you did that impressed people that were watching that you didn't know were watching? So I think it was just that I really kind of embodied the culture of the zoo. Uh, like I shared that I didn't grow up wanting to work with animals. I never envisioned myself working at a zoo in any in any kind of capacity one day. Uh, but I kind of, over the years, I, I learned to love the animals and kind of what the Houston Zoo stands for when it comes to protecting wildlife. And I think it was just that I was kind of taking on that and I was, like I love, they could see that I loved what I did during the summer, and I definitely didn't feel that same way during the school year. They didn't see that, but and I also like I started bringing the Houston Zoo culture into my classroom too, and so I I took my students on field trips to the zoo. I we had an animal fact of the day because I learned so much about animals and I really enjoyed it. But I think it was also just that I wanted to learn as much as I could about that and I shared that with them and I just kind of became this bubbly person that I normally wasn't when I was teaching fifth graders uh, at the I became this bubbly person at the zoo because I was in this environment that was very accepting and open and just you didn't have to follow a set of standards there were no state tests to worry about and it's just being that kind of the best person I could be in that place and in that role and so they just saw what I could be and so Daniel, you said that repeatedly all the jobs you've gotten for, you've had really good references that have allowed you to do that. Can you provide some advice about, for young people, what can we do to make sure that we're gonna get good references to get the jobs that we want, right? Because that seems to be something very important. Yeah, I mean, kind of along the line of what my uh, esteemed uh, co-panelists have said. <laughs> um, the, the people I've been impressed with that I've worked with, um, don't, don't stop working while they're at work. Right, they, they are always looking for something to do, are willing to step in and be flexible with their roles. And then when it comes to a skill they don't have, but they need to have it, they try. You know, they try and they move. And that's, you know, kind of a man of many hats role is something that I, I can handle and still kind of excel. So I think that's, that's one of the things is seeing new skills, seeing a place that this organization with needs to grow well, I'll grow that, you know, I'll do that. And so that's, that I think is, is one of the, one of the ways to impress, but definitely when it comes down to work ethic is what most hirers want. And so if people can comment on your work ethic, and so you have to, you have to go work with people, you know, if it's volunteers or summer interns or summer programs, um, like people are, that's where people have to learn your work ethic. It's kind of, Again, that the theme emerges over and over again that if you want to form a good network, you have to recognize that. So I'll, I'll give you an If you want to form a good network, you need to make connections with people that are more important than you. I think this is something that we like have to recognize, <laughs> right? Like me having a network connection with someone on the same level with me is okay, but really to advance my career, I need somebody who's above me in the network level. And one of the things that they've all identified is they have identified somebody that is above them in an organization, and they thought about what does that person want to see from me in this world, right? What do they want to see so that I can look good in their eyes, right? And I can meet the needs for their organization, their what they think is important. And so it tells you like another secret of networking. There's a ton of people out there, they're all skilled. You have to stand out, and the way that you stand out is by figuring out what somebody above you wants and becoming that thing sometimes. 
right? So sometimes it's very helpful to look to see your bosses. What are they doing and what do they appreciate, right? I would say that um, being, being young or beginning in a career is an advantage because, you know, the, that old thing where people went to their neighbors and borrowed flour was a great way to introduce yourself to your neighbors because people love uh, providing a service. People love helping other people. It's just one of the facts about humanity. And it may be downplayed in our kind of current world, but um, the reason that flower thing works is because the neighbor is happy to help, right? Your mentors are your first space. They're, you're, if you don't have a mentor that's kind of in the field of profession you are considering, get one. Because that's one person that has influence that one person, that's a person that's above you, you know, they're not more, they're not better than you, but they have more, um, I mean, what's the word? You know? Clout. Clout, yeah. Um, I was gonna say swagger, but that wasn't the right one. <laughs> um, but they have more like, uh, they have that thing. They're the start of a network, you know, they'll do, they'll do it for you because they know you need the help. So don't be afraid to say, hey, like, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have a mentor, get one um, and ask them to help you and, that's like a great way. If I, if I feel like I've helped somebody, if I feel like I've you know seen someone along a little bit in their career, I'm very apt to recommend them, right? I'm very apt to like support them. So that's just kind of something, you know, if you can show growth through a mentor program or mentor relationship, that can be a, a great step in, great step forward. And don't be afraid to ask for that help to, for, a, for a mentor because they're, all of us, we got here today because we, we talk to people that are in, sometimes in the positions that we want to be in. And those people that are higher are sometimes higher up in the organizations, they want to kind of grow the next leaders of their organization. And so I work with college students all year long and I tell them all the time, like, if you want, if, if you want in my advice, I'm more than happy to, to uh, give it to you, but I'm not gonna force it upon you. And they never come to me and I'm just like, I'm here, I've been in this field. like take use my time like that's I want to help you guys and so don't be afraid to ask for help we are all here everybody that's sitting on these panels today I guarantee you would be more than happy to answer your questions to kind of help get you to where you want to be you also don't know who these other people know you know oftentimes um, if if somebody came up to me in my professional setting, oh, you know, I have a question about edible plants. I'm not the person to ask about that. I don't even know about regular plants. I don't, I, I don't, can't find my way through the produce section, but I know a guy now. So I say, you know, I, I know a guy, you know? And so although, you know, the person you're talking to might not be the, you know, exactly in line with what you want to do, they likely know a lot of people mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and, and you don't know who they know. Um, you know, and a lot of times you don't even know who they're married to or who their parents are or something, and they, and they have a weird connection mm -hmm. through that. You know, maybe, uh, you know, my wife happens to be, she's not, but you know, the edible plant captain of the world or whatever, you're right? And, and, and that, and I can make that connection. But Your you wife's know, Mia Walker? <laughs> uh, so, you know, you don't, you don't know these, you don't know these things. And um, so it, it's, it's often good to form connections, even though it might not be exactly what you want, they're often connected and through these sort of second or third things you, you can, um, you can find the person you want to talk to. That's, yeah, that's very true. Any questions for anybody in the audience? So, do you have any advice for keeping in touch with your networks long term, um, especially as students? Like, there's not a lot we can offer at the moment to help your like connections. Like, what advice do you have for keeping in touch, making sure that your connection or network isn't going to fall apart? And, uh... What I mean, what uh, kind of industry are you interested in joining? So, whatever that is, has a handful of professional groups. You know, if it's prairies, if it's oil, there are groups that do things. There are educational opportunities. Be, being physically where they are is, you know, a really important thing. Like if you, if you switched, you know, all the way from the Houston Arboretum to Memorial Park, you know, you might have the opportunity to see those people because they're exactly the same place. You know, they're right there. Um, you can see them by going, driving over and like, you know, a four wheel drive vehicle, you don't need a car even. Anyway, um, but like there's, you know, prairie associations and conservation associations and conferences along those things. And so I would say 
figuring out those simple free groups uh, that are interested in your career and starting to go to them now. Like, don't wait to start going to them. Um, people are friendly and outgoing in those places because they're places where they're comfortable being passionate about what they're passionate about. So that, to me, that's one practical bit of advice is, you know, learning what professional groups there are and attending those groups. If you have like particular people in mind that are already a part of your network that you want to grow, I would say just kind of keep them up to date with what you're doing, but not in a like, I'm going to email them once a week and just fill them in on my life. Like that's a little much. But like if you're about to graduate and you're looking at internships or if you're looking at job opportunities, like reach out to them for advice if you have a question about it. Just kind of like keeping them as part of the conversation in this field. Uh, I have several interns that I didn't actually personally work with that I that keep me updated on what they're doing because of the program that I run. And I will, I've also offered to give them advice as well and they, they come to me for it. And so just kind of, even though I've never actually worked with them, just ha by having them be associated with the program at the zoo, we kind of have that line going. And they know that no matter where they end up in their trajectory, that the Houston Zoo is somebody that they can come back to and talk with. So just kind of keeping them up to date. Just don't let them, basically don't let them forget about you is kind of an important thing too. And that's really not that hard to do because like they, it's not like they're going to forget about you. But if you see someone that's part of that network in public, you say hi. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like your old friends from high school where you ignore them. You know, it's like, a, it's you, you just say hello. Hey, man, you know, whatever, that's it. So mm -hmm. it's not too hard to, to be visible. And yeah. I had a really challenging time with that. I did a lot of internships in, well, I was in, in undergraduate and graduate school. Um, and they were in very different places. I went to undergraduate on the West Coast, I went to graduate school on the East Coast. Um, I did an internship in Alaska and in Florida. So I, I hit every, you know, I was in all these very like regionally different places. So they weren't people that I regular, regularly made contact with. But what I will say is, is these projects, especially in conservation, rarely come to an end. You know, if you are an internship, you know, do an internship at a national park, they don't pack up that national park when you leave and, 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 and put it away, right? Like, they continue to go on. So if you work on a species of bird or a species of turtle, that, you know, that species still exists and there's still people working on it. So there's still a way you can keep track um, and, and keep in touch with them. But it can be difficult. But, uh, you know, I do try to keep up just because of my personal interest, but also with... Um, you know, as a, as a way to network, keep up with those projects that I worked on. If I see something in the news, uh, I worked on sea turtles when I worked on an Air Force base in Florida, and when they got hit by um, the, the hurricane that moved through, they actually destroyed their offices, and I sent them a quick email, checked in with them, and saw how they were doing, and started up a conversation with that. Um, when a, a, a friend of mine who I used to work on uh, whooping cranes with actually stayed at my house yesterday because I um, needed a place to stay. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it, there, there, there's ways you can keep in touch and keep in touch with those projects uh, because they always continue on. Um, you know, maybe you used to work for the Katy Perry. When you left, they didn't roll the Katy Perry up and put it in storage. It's still there and there's still people working on it. So you can still go back there and, and keep in touch with them. Um, I guess this is sort of for all three of you, maybe. Um, I was a teacher for quite a while and decided that um, I needed to change my life. Um, so I just graduated from a &M with uh, an ecological restoration Ooh. degree. Sorry. <laughs> and um, uh, rangeland ecology and management and uh, watershed management. Well, as I guess someone who's trying to change careers at an age I'm not saying out loud, um, it's a little bit more different because I can't just, you know, go take an internship somewhere for, you know, six months out of, you know, out of state or whatever. So I know that I'm usually, well, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, it seems like a lot of the employers want younger people because, you know, they can do the internships and get the experience and how did you... How do I go around that to make people see that I'm just as relevant as anyone else, even though I can't take off for three months to go get an internship somewhere? Well, I mean, I, I wasted seven years of my career doing youth ministry. So, you know, I know, boo. -hoo. Um, but, uh, I'm going to use some too. It's okay. Okay, great. Thanks. But, um, so, again, it was about really, like, specializing 
and and knowledge, being becoming a knowledge specialist, but really like deepening and lengthening that topic um, that was that was there. And uh, you know, I think that people want to hire people that work well. You know what I mean? And if there's a way to translate your old career's success and what you're good at, and just like express that to new to the new places you want to work, um, that to me is like, but. It's hard for you in an interview to be like, I tell you, I'm a hard worker. Well, what are your biggest faults? Oh, I, I work too hard. You know, it's like, okay. You know. But so, but having other people say how amazing you are is really, that's what, that's what people believe. That's what resonates with hirers. Um, and so like building, building up your reference sheet, knowing that's going to be the best part of your resume until you, you know, get the job you want. Um, but yeah, I have done a lot of volunteer work. And, you know. uh, that's what I was going to say is that kind of getting your name out there and kind of getting into the field in whatever way you can is kind of the best thing to do. Having that volunteer experience, maybe even part-time positions at some of these institutions. I know so many of the places around the sit around Houston, around this area are looking for part-time people, especially during the summer when it comes because we're hiring summer camp teachers at the zoo if anybody's interested. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You, well, we can talk, uh, <laughs> but any any kind of foot in the door is kind of key. I tell my interns this all the time: is that having that experience and getting into all these different places, whether it's volunteering, whether it's part time, that's going to pay off in the long run. Because even though you're volunteering, you're not just doing that by yourself. You're talking to other people. You're growing your network through that. So kind of reach and reaching back out to that network to see what's available is also another good idea to do. Uh, Entrepreneurship is an incredibly effective route to getting something good. And so even if you're starting something that's just consulting or something like that, to be able to say like, well, even though I've not been you know, with a company, I'm new to this, like I've consulted with blank and blank. And you know, with your, with your major, there are smaller farms and ranches that can't hire a big time consultant. And to just to be able to say like, I, I'm so passionate I started something on my own. You know, so that, I mean, that's like, there's a lot of hoops to jump through, but it's starting a small business is the same for every single person every single time. So anybody that's done it can kind of give practical advice on that, but mostly it's just filling out the right paperwork. Um, I've done a lot of research on that. Yeah. Especially with, you know, being a woman trying to start in a new business, you may get a little extra perks that some other people might not get if you're trying to start a small business. Yeah, there's some legal perks, but there's some kind of social not perks. Um, I mean, there's just, you know, people, it's not, it's not set up for success that way. So, um, but I, I do think that that kind of starting your own business thing is a great way to kind of show that you're serious about this subject and you're committed to it. Um, and then that also gives you a place to specialize. And I don't want to say that word too often, but I already have. Uh, I know we approve too. But yeah. Thanks. Great question. So uh, I actually went to a, a session recently for professionals on mentoring, and the, one of the things that they focused on was that maybe just having one mentor isn't the best thing to do. So like not so thinking about like I really respect this person, and I kind of want to hear what they have to say, but I also respect this person as well. Like don't limit yourself to finding one mentor. Reach out to several people in the field that you might be interested in, and again, just having those conversations kind of throughout is really key. So don't feel like you have to go leave today and be like, I need to find a mentor. Just just one because there's two. There's all of us need one, and there's not enough out there. But just really think about like who in your circle do you want to learn from, and kind of work in that. Use those questions to help you. I don't say if you do have an option. You know, and there's like multiple people to choose from who someone that can actually like give you time and take time to spend with you talking through things, talking about things and it potentially even like be serious about the relationship, like give you required reading or something like that are good signs of someone who wants to be invested. So someone that has time and desire to invest in you. So does that make sense? And so if somehow you can figure that out, but you know, more than one is not bad. <laughs> I would, I would look especially if um, a lot of times in university settings, a lot of the people 
who have been in the, in the field for a long time are professors and things that have taken this academic route. If that's not the route that you want to take, um, you know, their advice and their guidance might not be as applicable about somebody who's in a different part of that profession. Um, so if you can reach out outside of the university sphere, um, that's a really good way to do that. And, and one of the great ways to do that is to get connected with alum who um, started off in a position sort of similar to where you are and kind of made their own way. And by being alum, you already sort of have this initial connection um, of, of, of having a common background. Um, and that might help you get a little bit further away from academia if that's not what you're interested in. And a lot of times, um, they, they may have great advice if you want to get into academia, get into research or whatever, but their advice or their career paths might not be applicable for the way the job market looks right now. So I think we've had some really good advice, especially on the concept of mentorship, right? So I think one of the things that they've said, which I think is very, very true, there are people like us that are professionals that want to just help people. And there's a ton of people out there like that. We all like to feel like we're helping, we're giving back, we're doing something. And so most professionals will agree to work with you in a mentorship role if you come at them with a genuine interest to work with them. And I think having multiple mentors, especially at a younger age, is a really good idea because you never know what you might become. So having more people to give you more ideas of what you can or cannot do with your existence is really important, right? You may come talk to me, I'm a college professor. I might tell you, be a college professor. I don't wanna do that, right? I might be able to give you advice that are helpful in other ways, but you might need somebody that gives you advice in a more career specific way. So having multiple mentors is really, really valuable, okay? So can we thank our panelists? I thought they did a wonderful job. We're going to meet back